at 11 o'clock and if you have anything that you want to put uh, get together for communion you're welcome to join us in communion uh, a cracker a cookie juice milk whatever you might have uh, to represent Christ's body and blood uh, as we share in communion with each other Those, those who have logged on, stay with us in just a few moments. Uh, right at 11 o'clock, we'll be starting. Uh, we're so thankful that you're joining us and know that uh, it is a hard, a difficult time when we're not able to meet together. But we want you to know that those of us who are here in the congregation uh, want to welcome you that are also part of our congregation online. Thank you for being here. Uh, we're going to be going ahead and doing some things online. If you haven't already got you, uh, some communion things set aside, whatever elements that you plan to use, wafer, uh, cracker, uh, cookie, glass of milk, juice, do that. And you're welcome to join us in our communion at the end of the service. 
and we're going to go ahead and start today. We've been, uh, as we've been meeting this time, and especially because of a, uh, a lot of people been joining us virtually, we've been lighting a candle to remind us that God is wherever we are. Where two or three are gathered together, God is there with us. So we want to light that now. And then I, let's pray this morning. God, we ask that your spirit be with each person who is here, each person who is listening online, each person who will. God, we know that you have a special calling upon each of our hearts and lives. God, you've got us here for a moment. May your word illuminate it to us. May your will be laid out for us. May we know, God, that you are a God that loves us before we leave these walls before we leave this chat room, God, that we know that you, without a doubt, love us. And we thank you for that, Jesus. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Again, we so welcome that you're here with us. You're welcome to join us in praise and worship. Uh, the, the words will come up on the screen and join us as you sing praises to our God.
Thomas, amen. You may be seated. Uh, I was watching for some of the prayer requests to come in. I didn't see any come on from the uh, uh, <clears throat> from the online, our face, Facebook online, but we do want to share some uh, that we've had uh, this week and earlier in this week. I uh, want to remember a friend of Danny's um, named Tracy. He has cancer, so we remember him. Rob and Danny also lost their dog, Mandy, as well as Mike and Tony uh, lost their oldest dog. Uh, pray for my sister-in-law's father, my brother's father-in-law. Um, he has uh, pancreatic cancer. Uh, the tumor's too large to operate yet, so they're going to have to give him chemo. Uh, and then he's had it, this weekend's been a bad weekend in the hospitals for him, so just pray for him and, and my sister-in-law's family uh, as they look after him. Also, uh, member Troy, uh, his uh, cancer has come back, uh, and he's the doctors. He's still in good spirits about it, uh, but the doctors are looking at what possible treatments are he- out for him. So he's waiting for answers and and the diagnosis from them. Uh, also, we want to be praying for uh, Rose. Had major oral surgery this week. Uh, Rose, you, I guess you're healing from that. Good, good. Bless you. Good to see you. Uh, uh, so Tamara asked us to pray for her as she's dealing with some negative spirit from some folks, and so want to pray for that as well. Um, Dina wants us to continue remembering her dad and the loss of his wife and Dina's mom. And frontline workers, educators, uh, students, parents, uh, all those we want to make sure that we're lifting them up to God, God protecting them, uh, praying for racial, inequ- uh, racial inequality in our country and praying that uh, uh, we'll have a more equitable w- uh, nation, that we'll treat each other uh, with the brotherly and sisterly love that we should. Uh, also, uh, praise Rashad has a new job, and so give praise to that. And Dina and Zach also have a praise. They they got a car this week, so give praise for that as well. Other prayer requests or things that you have maybe here in the congregation to share? All right, let's go to God then this morning. God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your healing. We thank you for your hand upon us, God, when we need comforting and guidance. We thank you that we're surrounded by your love. And so each of these situations, God, remind us that you are surrounding them in love. The results may not be the way we would like them. We may not see uh, see even your hand upon it. But God, we know without a doubt your love is upon it. So we pray, God, that you help us. Remind us that you're walking with us even through, though, even through the valley of the shadow of death, God. You're right there with us. May you comfort us and guide us with your word and with your, with your strong hand. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Please rise as you're able. And if you're at home, uh, you're sitting, sit at attention as we give uh, praise to God this morning. God be with you. A reading from the Holy Scripture, the letter to the Roman Church, chapter 13, verses 8 through 14. Let us give glory to God. Glory to thee, O God. Owe nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirements of God's law. For the commandments say you must not commit adultery, you must not murder, you must not steal, you must not covet. These and other such commandments are summed up in this one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to others. So love fulfills the requirements of God's law. This is all the more urgent for you now, uh, for you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up, for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. Because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity and immoral living or in quarreling or jealousy. Instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't let yourself think about other ways to indulge your evil desires. This is the Holy Scripture. Amen. You may be seated. Now, usually I, when I preach a sermon and, and, and use a passage like this, 
most of the time I start at the beginning and kind of go through the passage. But today I'm going to be a little bit backwards in the way we look at it. I want to look at the latter part of it and then move forward to the front part of it. Love does no wrong to others is my sermon title today. And, and it made me think when I heard that verse and read that portion of the verse, it made me think of the Hippocratic Oath. You know, the, the oath that doctors have. I've memorized the Hippocratic Oath. It's a clackety, 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 clack. <laughs> to be, be fair, that's the hungry, hungry Hippocratic Oath. So I might be, uh, uh, if you play little kids games. All right, yeah. No, the Hippocratic Oath, we know that, is first do no harm. And that reminded me of when I read the, the passage, love does no wrong to others. Now, the second part of this is an urgent part. And um, the Apostle Paul says that time is running out. Reminds me of a story, Pastor Debbie, she went to visit an older congregant one day, and she told a parishioner, you know, in your advanced age, you should really be thinking about the hereafter. And he answered her, oh, I do, I do it all the time. And he explained, no matter where I am, in the living room, upstairs, in the kitchen, or down in the basement, I'm always asking myself, now why am I here? For what am I here after? That's what he, sorry, I messed that up. Now what am I here after? That's the hereafter that he's thinking about. Salvation, the Apostle Paul says, is here and nearer now than ever before. Now, I believe that we are living in our own salvation, that the salvation is not something great in a by and by, that when you receive Christ, when you have a relationship with God, your salvation starts then, and it is an ongoing thing. John 10.10 10 says, Jesus said, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Our abundant life starts in the beginning, and our relationship with God, our relationship with God's people, and the way we relate to other people through Christ is an abundant thing, and it starts now. And I believe now, during this pandemic, now more than any other time, we need to be thinking about the last times, at least for the last time for ourselves, if nothing else. Whatever your current circumstance is, we should be thinking about the last time. In fact, the message, the translation from the message, I was reading our passage today from the New Living Translation, but the message says, but make sure that you don't get so absorbed and exhausted in taking care of your day-by-day -day obligations that you lose track of the time and doze off oblivious to God. Folks, it's easy when you're during this pandemic, you're staying at home or, you're, or things aren't the way they normally are and not being able to come to church and, and all those kind of things. It's very easy to get so caught up in our day-to-day -day life that we're oblivious to God. Don't let that happen. The Apostle Paul also says in 2 Corinthians chapter two, uh, 6, verse 2, excuse me, he says, For God says, At just the right time I heard you, and on that day of salvation I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. Folks, more than anything, today is the day of salvation. We need to recognize that. In fact, I'm, besides, like I said, I was starting things a little backwards. I'm going to be basically offering an altar call. Now, I know that uh, it's not that easy. People don't want to get on camera if you're actually coming to the altar. People who are online can't really just run on down here to the altar call. But I, I believe if you do not know Jesus Christ today, you can. And most of the time, a pastor will offer the altar call at the end of the service and invite people to know Christ. But that's not what I'm doing now. I'm starting at the beginning doing that. You see, sin is anything that separates us from God. Sin is anything that separates us from each other. And sin is anything that separates you from who you're supposed to be in Christ. And the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 says that. And then he says, and the wages of sin is death. That means that separation between you and God is death. That separation between you and others is, is at least a, a relationship death. That separation brings death. But the gift of Jesus is eternal life. Romans 6.23 and God showed love for us while we were still sinners by Christ dying for us, which is Romans 5.8. 
And then Romans 10 says, so if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. And that chapter continues to say, and anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Folks, that's anyone. Whoever you are, whether you're here with us today, whether you're online with us or you'll be watching sometime later, God wants you in a right relationship and it's already been made. That right relationship's been made for us because of Jesus. All you have to do is ask. If you have any questions or you want to talk to me more about that, I'd be happy to talk to you. Uh, you can send a, a message. You can uh, do a direct message or anything like that or speak to me after church. But that's basically my altar call at the beginning of my sermon. Love does no wrong to others. There's five areas I'd like to think about that. First of all, that includes self. It includes our significant others. It includes spiritually others. And it also includes society, which is, that's four. How did I do five? Anyway, that's four. <laughs> First of all, self. You may have heard it said before, Mama RuPaul says, if you can't love yourself, how in the hell are you going to love somebody else? Can I get an amen? Amen. Lucille Ball said, love yourself first and everything else will fall into place. Self-love, though, is not the same as self-care. We do have to recognize that we do need to be taking care of ourselves. There are things, whether it's uh, getting the exercise you need, whether it's uh, exercising your mind and your souls and your bodies, those are ways that we do self-care. That is part of self-love. Self-care is. God created us and wants the best for our bodies. Wants the best for us in all areas of our lives. That is self-care. But self-love shouldn't be something that's self-serving. Self-love shouldn't be something that's greedy. And it's not based upon how other people perceive us. And it's certainly not based upon how you perceive yourself. It's not based upon your circumstances that you may be going through, whether you love yourself or not. And it's not based upon your internalized thoughts about yourself. You see, you can have grandiose thoughts about yourself, and you can have negative self-image things, and they still, neither one of those are real self-love. Our culture wants us to love ourselves by putting ourselves first. And that's the reason in public discourse that sometimes it becomes poisonous. It's also the reason why many Americans spend more than a billion dollars each year on their teeth whiteners. Yikes. Yeah, that's corporately all, uh, all Americans spend over a billion dollars on teeth whiteners. Like, I mean, does that make your teeth healthier just because they look healthier? A billion dollars just to look better. That's putting ourselves first. See, what God means by loving ourselves is more powerful. It's incredibly powerful. We love and value ourselves based upon the finished work of the cross that Jesus was on. At the cross, we identify who Jesus calls us to be. And that grace that is displayed and the love that is displayed just for us. That is an everlasting love. Out of gratitude and for the grace of God in our salvation, we should present our bodies as living sacrifice in our worship and our service of God. Matthew 22, Jesus says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And then he quotes Leviticus 19, 18, which says, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If we're supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves, we first need to be loving ourselves the way God loves us. Recognizing that we are children of the Most High God. That we have a place in the courts of heaven because of Christ. That is why we look at ourselves and love ourselves and recognize ourselves. And if we're loving ourselves appropriately, then it's easy to love other people. Speaking of other people, what about our significant others? Last week we read 
the portion of this in Romans 12 that says, don't just pretend to love others, really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Folks, if we had more of that in our relationships, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? And I'm not just talking about your intimate, significant other, but I'm talking about all of our relationships, whether it's a coworker or a neighbor or the person you just can't stand. If we are really loving, now, the hating what is wrong, most people get that, and I had to talk about that a little bit last week. The hating what's wrong, that's not hating what's wrong in somebody else's life. That's hating what's wrong in your life about the way you love other people. And hold tightly to the good. That's, that's recognizing when you are doing right and loving other people. That continued in verse 14, in verse, chapter 12, verse 14, says, Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. When was the last time you prayed that God would bless somebody that you just couldn't stand? Wow. Some of you, it's your partner, <laughs> your spouse, your husband, your wife, and you're just mad at them in the moment. How about asking God to bless them in that moment? How easy would that be? It's not easy, certainly, but we're called to do that. Often churches uh, and pastors and 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 uh, marriage ceremonies use 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We often call it the love chapter. You may know it, and I encourage you to read it if you, if you haven't paid attention to it before. It's a, the passage of Scripture that starts out with love is patient, love is kind, et cetera, et cetera. And really, we should be, churches have done that sir, this uh, disservice because we've done this passage a great disservice because this wasn't written to a couple that's getting married. This was written to the church. Paul wrote this to a church, a group of people that came from all different backgrounds, all socially economically backgrounds, all different races, and was telling them to love each other and giving some practical ways to love each other. And folks, we need to be paying attention to that in church. And not just as Christians. If you call yourself a Christian, we need to insist that we read that passage of Scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Maybe even commit portions of it to memory. If we call ourselves Christians, we should be living in love. And so if we're doing it for the rest of the community in the body, then certainly we should be doing it for our significant others or those that we love in our families and things. Now, Paul flips on, uh, does a flip side of, the, of love. He directs our attention to what love shouldn't do. Specifically, he says, love does no wrong to our neighbors or to other people. Again, our attention toward Godward, providing both the motivation and the means in living in love. Paul directs us to think about our initial salvation and of our final salvation and of the limited time which we have to offer God our service of worship. And that service of worship should be the way we love other people. Now, I do want to stop for just a minute. Some churches don't talk about sex. And if they do, it's usually negative. It usually has all the wrong connotations and a, and a, and a control thing. But I want to encourage you to think about say, sex and, and as a sexually safe and sane and consensual. The MCC Ministry Leadership Code of Ethics says this, and I, I like to read a part of this. Sexually responsible ministry leaders affirm sexuality as a gift from God are, and strive to honor this gift by conducting our own lives in accordance with responsible, positive sexual ethics in, a, in accordance. A positive sexual ethic balances desire within the embodied framework of our emotional, physical, sexual, and spiritual selves while preserving and honoring mutuality and consent. Basically, they're saying there are some things that shouldn't be doing. Shouldn't be any kind of sexual misconduct of, of a minor. Shouldn't be any sexual abuse or, or of anyone that isn't able to be legally competent and maybe a vulnerable adult. 
It shouldn't be around sexual harassment. Nobody should have to listen to or have to put up with coarse jokes or language or comments that would be sexually uh, undesired. And using one's uh, position of privilege for sexual exploitation shouldn't happen either. And the attempt to develop a sexual relationship with someone that has it been pastoral or supervisory relationship should also be discouraged. But they do admit at times a clergy person or a pastoral leader may develop an appropriate sexual relationship within the context of the community, including the congregation in which the person is serving, if there's been no direct supervision or individual spiritual counseling. Such relationships are to be entered in with extreme caution and a spirit of discernment. You see, folks, we're trying to be sex sexually positive, but also at the same time, we do, need to, we do know that many times people take advantage of others. And that leads me to intimate partner violence and to speak about that. UCLA uh, Williams Law Center showed that most studies found a lifetime a prevalence of intimate partner violence against the LGBT community, and it is higher uh, than the general population. Research showed that the LGBT people face barriers to seeking help that are unique to their sexual orientation and their gender identities, and it includes questions about individual sexual orientation and, and gender identity in their surveys uh, would help, maybe help some in the advance of the research. They say that the CDC says that intimate partner sexual violence survey that violence among bisexual women is more than heterosexual women, that the violence against the, the intimate partner violence against bisexual women is against more than heterosexual women, and fortunately or unfortunately, uh, reporting at the same time that heterosexual women and uh, lesbians have about the same amount of um, intimate partner violence. So it's basically just as high. So these are our mothers and our sisters and our daughters. And we need to be looking after them and thinking about how they are treated. And then our men. Bisexual men seem to be more likely to report than their heterosexual or gay uh, counterparts. But gay men seem to be more likely than heterosexual men to, uh, seem to be less likely than heterosexual men to report that they've been a uh, violence, and yet still 30% of homosexual men do report that they've been in, uh, in experience intimate partner violence. So you can imagine those that don't report because out of fear or whatever like that. And then in the trans community, that's just, I can't even, can't even phantom how horrible it is. That's why we have every year, November 20th, Transgender Day of Remembrance. Because the overwhelming majority of trans people are killed at the hands of their intimate partners. How sad. And the violence they must have to put up with, which they shouldn't have to put up with. LGBT people face barriers and are seeking help. Some of it's legal barriers. Some of it's a, a fear of being outed. Some of it's fear of the, I, the isolation that they have from their family. Maybe they just don't know any other survivors and they just don't know that there might be LGBT specific or LGBT friendly groups that will help them. Folks in our area, our community, I do know they will help. In, the, in Tarrant County and Dallas County both, if you go to a domestic violence group, they will help. Anybody, it doesn't matter what your relationship is, it doesn't matter if you identify in the LGBT spectrum, they will help you. There will not be homophobic staff or anything like that. They'll do their best to help you. And if not, call me, I can get you to the right place. So next is our spiritual love. Doing no harm to others. I read a joke about a bored young man who decided that he, life would be a little bit more fun if he bought a pet and he wanted something unique. So he went to the pet store and he got a centipede. That's a, the 100 leg bug, you know. And he had a little white box that came in and that he used for its house. And when he took the box back home, he found a good spot for it and he decided that he would start taking his new pet with him to church because obviously he could take it with him. It wouldn't be disruptive or anything. So he asked the centipede inside the box, he says, would you like to go to church with me today? 
you'll have a good time. But obviously there wasn't an answer from his new pet. And this bothered him a little bit. But he waited a few minutes and he asked again, how about going to church with me so that you can receive blessings? And again, there was no answer from his new friend, his pet. So he waited a few more minutes and he was thinking about the situation. Then the guy decided to invite the centipede one last time. This time he put his face right up to the centipede's house and he shouted, Hey in there, would you like to go to church with me and learn about God? And this time a little voice came out of the box and said, I heard you the first time. I was just putting on my shoes. <laughs> Sometimes when we think about church, we think about all those times that ministers or self-righteous or Bible thumpers have shouted at us. You probably experienced it. We sometimes equate our churches with those shouting, those and being shouted out and shouted at. That's spiritual abuse, folks. We know too many times the theological malpractice of when people use scriptures to cause harm instead of bring life to people. We need to have more healthy churches. We need to have an understanding of what a healthy church is. And so in, in our healthy churches, we'll have healthier people. And God's word is supposed to be bringing harmony to us, not disunity. Reverend Elder Mel White, he's a MCC, uh, uh, el for, a former elder, in, uh, retired elder of ours. He has a book, and I want to encourage you to go get this book. It, and you can go to his website, melwhite.org. You can download it for free. His book called Six Angry Evangelicals. Use the imaginary gay threat to divide a nation, elect a president, and undermine a democracy. And in it, he tells some of the history of some of the, these uh, evangelicals that he used to work closely with, that he used to shadow with, that he used to write even for, and how they have changed this uh, gay threat to divide us and do some of the horrible things that they do in the name of God. Last week, I was... My sermon title, What's So Funny About Peace, Love, and Understanding, I was quoting Elvis Costello, and uh, unfortunately I found out many of you don't even know who Elvis Costello is. In fact, some guys, uh, I'll tell you Jason and Aaron, uh, I mean, Jason and Ivan, uh, they said, is that Elvis Presley's other name? I'm like, no. <laughs> Elvis Presley's middle name is Aaron, so it has nothing to do with that. Now, if you spell Aaron with one A, or you spell it with two A's for Elvis. Uh, there's a whole conspiracy theory about that, If just for a side sake. You can go to his grave site, and it has the two A's, but his name originally has one A. And so that sometimes people think that Elvis might not be there because of the misspelling. But spiritual abuse is the act of making people believe, whether by stating or merely implying, that they're going to be punished in this life or tormented in a hellfire forever, for failure to live up to the good and to please God to get their admission into heaven. So the underlying message of this is control, trying to control somebody's behaviors. And a church that's doing that kind of thing, that is abuse. The underlying issue of all forms of abuse is control. You can go to spiritwatch.org. They have a couple of books, Churches That Abuse and Recovering from Churches That Abuse. But basically they say about church abuse, number one, reason why it happens and how it happens and what to watch out for is you have unchecked authoritarian leadership. If there's no governing board, if there's no uh, uh, clergy uh, group that they're supposed to apply to and have a code of ethics to admit to, then that's an unchecked authoritarian leadership and that needs to be needs to be called out. If there's an imbalance in congregational life, that's these unspec unspoken expectations, this health, unhealthy form of de uh, dependency that you've got to be at the church all the time and that you can't be a part of these other people. You can't even be friends with your neighbors because it's the church. That's an unhealthy, imbalanced congregational life. Also, the other is conscious threats of discipline or the disfellowshipping of. That's the shunning and the criticizing. And it reminds me of the Game of Thrones scene from Cersei when she is stripped naked and uh, her hair is cut and she's had to parade it through the town and they're shaking this thing at her saying, shame, 
shame, shame. And they're constantly shaking this bell and calling her shame as she's walking through the whole town. That reminds me of this kind of thing that churches do sometimes. The next one is deliberate disruption of personal relationships. They don't want you having relationships with anyone outside of their congregation. And they dis deliberately disrupt those. And lastly, a sign of a church that abuses is they encourage your withdrawal and isolation from anything of the outside. Mitchell Gold is the editor of a book I read and I really liked it. It's called LGBT Queer Crisis 40. And it was 40 different stories that reveal the personal, social, and religious pain and trauma of growing up gay in America. And it really was unsettling to read some of these stories of people and what their churches and what their families and who were supposed to be religiously um, loving and yet weren't. The bigotry that people went through. I, a friend of mine just recently shared on his Facebook his name. Uh, he was just sharing recently that he had, him and his partner had gone to the, the pool of their condo. And uh, he was talking to a neighbor and, and, his, and his partner was in the pool and um, they were, he was talking to the neighbor and they were chatting and the neighbor knew a little bit about their life that they've been together for five years and, and, they, and he knew a little bit that they had been ministers, they both had been ministers and he, he just didn't know they were still ministers. But then he, after a minute he says, so guys, let me ask you something. And I'm not trying to be judgmental. Now here's a hint, folks. When they say that, they really are being judgmental or I'm not trying to be racist or I'm not trying to be blah, blah, blah. They basically are saying it. That's a hint if you didn't get that hint. But anyway, he says, I'm not trying to be judgmental, but why did you steer away from Jesus and turn away from God? And my friend had to set him straight and say, look, we're both still in ministries. And the guy was just taken aback that how can you be you know, a Christian and, and be living in this gay lifestyle? I thought you had to choose between God and, your, and being gay. And then while his, he was trying to have this conversation with this gentleman, there were neighbor kids, uh, some teens, they were ridiculing them because they were making some snide remarks and some cruel intentions, talking about if you stay in the water too long next to them, you might turn gay too, or they might rape you if you get too close, implying that gay people are pedophiles. This was cruelty. These were negative stereotypes, hurtful things. And even the man that was setting, the neighbors heard the kids saying it and didn't call them out saying, you kids need to leave these people alone. They're just like the rest of us. He didn't call them out either. How horrible is that? Christians should stand against any kind of cruelty, against any minorities, against any outcast, even if that cruelty comes from our politicians. We should be standing against that. When somebody assumes that the poor deserve their poverty, that's a wrong, hurtful assumption. When someone assumes that an unwed mother must, have, must also have loose morals, that's spiritual abuse, folks. When someone has addiction or some substance use issues, that they must not be close enough to God, these are hurtful stereotypes and there's so many others and these false assumptions about someone, it's wrong. My friend also said, that, that posted this thing, he later says, he says, bullies come in all shapes and sizes, genders, races, religious groups, etc. Bullies come in all the political flavors too. In fact, a bully is a person who believes that they have the right to assert power over another without another's permission. So the bullies benefit and the victim's detriment. If you think for a moment that bullies don't exist within the community that you align yourself with, I think you're naive. Be alert, especially to the ones within your own community, and don't excuse their behaviors. Call it out. Bullying is never justified, folks. It's all about control. And if we have a life in Christ, it should be Christ in control not someone else. The life in the church should be uplifting, folks. It should be life-giving. It should be Christ-centered. I posted on my Facebook page, um, and on mine and also I think on the churches, that, a little rainbow thing that says, I will officiate 
same-sex weddings. I will officiate interracial weddings. I'll officiate non-binary weddings. I'll officiate interfaith weddings. The weddings of any adults who wish to pr profess lifetime devotion to one another because we need more love in the world. You know, folks, you don't know how many times as pastor I get calls, and especially because we do the Together in, uh, together in Texas um, pre-marriage counseling class, the number of couples who call me feeling like there's nobody else out there that will help them. And it's not just the gay couples either. They're straight couples that had been married before. And there's so many churches that won't help them because they'd been married before, one or the other had. Or because they had a child out of wedlock. And churches won't help them. I, the worst story I remember, the saddest, I guess, that I remember, is uh, there was a couple that came, and they came through class, and they had their little baby with them, and they, they, they said they had four kids between them, but they had the, the baby that's still with them. The others were in school. And by the end of it, they were telling me more about themselves. I realized they, they were living in their SUV. They didn't have anywhere else to go. And the whole reason they were wanting to take this class was to save the $60 so they could go get their marriage license so that they could finally stay in a church-run shelter together. And the shelter wouldn't allow him to do it unless they were officially married. And so his kids and her kids, and they had their his, mine, and our kind of thing. And so they would be split up. And I'm like, that's ridiculous. And my heart broke immediately. I said, I'm taking you now. And so as soon as we finished with the class, I took them down to the courthouse. I paid the $11 myself because I, that's ridiculous. Because they, they were going to have to wait another week before they could come up with the $11. I paid it right then, I married him right then, and the parking lot of the, right downtown, there was a parking lot that was covered because it was raining by then, and I married him right then, we went back inside, gave them the license and certified it, and they were married in those moments so that they could spend one more night, uh, not have to spend one more night in that SUV because some church wouldn't allow it. Folks, that breaks my heart. Lastly, is we should be loving, and our love should not hurt others in society. My sister, when she was little, uh, my brother was a lot larger than, he was always larger than me, even though he was younger than me, he was always taller and bigger, uh, and so he was significantly, he was five years older than my sister, and they had gotten a little, uh, I don't know, spat or whatever. My little sister was really small, she wasn't even kindergarten yet, and my brother came in crying and probably over-exaggerating that she had kicked him. And, of course, my grandmother knew that, you know, you probably started it. He probably started it, and he's probably had good reason she kicked him. But then she also felt that she needed to kind of get on to my sister because, you know, Cheryl shouldn't be kicking anybody any, either. So she said, Cheryl Ann, why did you kick him? And she said, I'll kick anybody but the devil. <laughs> and my grandmother said, what? And she said, why, why, why would you say that? Why, why? And took my grandmother back a little bit. She said, why did she say that? And she said, because the devil might kick me back. <laughs> love is not only the motivation which should inspire our actions it's the principle by which our actions should be governed folks if we're loving God and loving others that, that should be an outgrowth of our salvation and sound doctrine and these things should give unity and harmony where they should be the story was told once about a missions group that went to on a border country and they were insincere in doing all the things that they did and, and they did many things for God there. A house was built and some children were being played with, the skits were performed and worship sung. But when it was lunchtime, the group sat there eating their lunch and they were talking in English. Uh, and they were relaxed and since they were considered themselves off duty. And they assumed their host didn't speak English either. And so somehow they started a little joke, and the joke sort of spiraled over, uh, as conversations sometimes do when people are tired, and, and their, their jokes sort of spiraled down and, and, and got to be not really funny and probably hurtful. And after lunch, the pastor of the church that was there uh, came to the youth group and, and the leadership of that church and said, please don't come back. It'll take us years to repair the damage that your group's conversation had caused. Oh no, the host must have spoke English. But the less obvious point is, 
It doesn't matter what language the host spoke. All of our actions, all of our words, they're fair game for people to judge our character. Jesus says they will know us by our love. John chapter 13. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Love does no wrong to others, folks. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your love. The example of that love in Christ as he gave himself so willingly, as he crossed all barriers to remind folks that, God, you love us and gave his very life so that we could be made right with you. God, help us to be more loving, fully loving of others and remind us that that love does no wrong to others. In Jesus' holy name, amen. We really thank you for your giving. And if you are on our website, you could welcome to go to that and, and scroll down to the bottom. There's a giving button there. You can do that securely, and uh, we appreciate that. You can also set up ongoing and sus sustained giving. That helps us and keeps this ministry and helps us to be who God calls us to be. It's your discipline. You're giving to God, and so we thank you for that. And we, and we try to be um, faithful in receiving those gifts and using them for God's mercy and glory as well. If you're here in the congregation with us, you're, we're not passing the plate around so that we won't have to have our hands touching it, but there is a plate near the office. You're welcome to put your offering in that plate on your way out, and so we thank you for that. You're also welcome to send in mail checks and, and the like. We, so, we still thank you for that. Uh, we've got many people that are ongoing givers, and so, so much thank you for your faithfulness to God in that. Let's share our confession today. You're welcome to read this aloud with us if you'd like. Lord, who loves those whom the world would hate, forgive our lack of love. When we claim to name your name to justify the evil we want to do, convict our souls, make our gut rot within us. When we choose to tear others down, ignoring their humanity, Make our eyes see the terror of what we are doing. Do not allow us to turn away. When we lift ourselves up at the expense of stealing life and hope from others, cause us to stumble in our theft. Break us of our pride. And when we cry out loud, Lord, Lord, but do not reach out to those whose voices are silenced, ignore our pleas. Teach us what it means to be abandoned. And in the end, Lord, you have given us only one command, only one thing by which we are to be known. You have given us love. Forgive us when we set love of others aside for love of ourselves. Forgive us of our boastings of our own strength. Forgive us the lies we tell when we claim we have no choice. Forgive us not because we are worthy of forgiveness, but because your forgiveness leads us to love. Lord, who loves those whom the world would hate, forgive our lack of love. Amen. Welcome to get your communion elements together as I'm preparing ours. We've had the opportunity to hear God's word today. We've said our confession aloud and in our hearts. In the name of God, our creator, Christ the child, and the Holy Spirit, our comfort and guide, I offer you God's forgiveness. 
go and forgive and love likewise. On the night that Christ was betrayed, he had gathered the disciples together. They were sharing in this meal. It was part of their Passover festivities. It was a time to reflect on what God had done for them as a people of faith. And he took a piece of bread and he blessed it. And God, we thank you for this. And then he said, this is my body. My body, which is given for you. Take and eat. And then he broke it and he passed it among them. And then he took a cup of wine, fruit of the vine. And he said, this is my blood. My blood that is freely poured out. My blood that I give for you. And whenever you eat this bread and drink this wine, remember me. Let's repeat the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ shall come again. Hallelujah. Beloved, this table is an open communion table. All are welcome to join us. Now we know that in our congregation size, that uh, the group that's here, you're welcome. You more or less got one of these little uh, disposable cups that has the wafer on the first layer and then the, the wine at the second layer. Whatever you're using, elements at home, I want to pray over those and bless that God will bless those now. God, we thank you for Christ's love, his very giving of himself. And God, as we take these elements, no matter what we're using, may we be reminded of Christ's willingly giving of his body and his blood. He asked us to remember him, and we are doing that. And the reason why he did that, God, was because of your love. We thank you. Jesus' holy name, amen. So as you take the body of our Lord and we eat, the blood of our Lord and drink, God, I pray for each person today. Whether this is their first time in joining us in communion, whether they've done it hundreds of times, God, I pray that you bless them. Those that are here in our congregation, those that may be watching now or soon to watch, God, we pray that you bless them. Remind them that God of your love. Remind them in our spirits that we are to love just as Christ so willingly gave of himself. We should give of ourselves to a world that desperately needs to know your genuine love. In Jesus' holy name, amen. For announcements, we do want to continue to remi remind you that we are having our services every Sunday at, uh, at uh, 11 o'clock, and we welcome you to do that. If you're online right now and you haven't uh, did something to say that you're here, like a greeting or a like or a share, then please do that. That helps us know that you're here and, and uh, lets us see that you're watching with us. We're so thankful for that. Also, our Wednesday nights, we have that at 7 o'clock, and we pray that you are able to join us in those times. Um, our congregation uh, is welcoming folks as and on a slowly basis, and so if you feel comfortable, you're welcome to do that. Uh, to come back and join us. We ask that you wear a mask. I'm not up here, but everybody's seated far enough away from me. Uh, but we ask that you wear a mask when you're in the building and, and close to each other. Keep that social distancing as we've got the chairs placed out. Lots of hand sanitizer. We thank you for that. And um, we just want to encourage you. If you need something from me as pastor, uh, let me know. Uh, if you need any kind of uh, pastoral care, I'm happy to help. Uh, in Jesus, we will do that. All right, all right, stand as you are able and for our final song together.
thank you for the opportunity to hear your word, to share these few moments with each other. God, I pray that as each other are connecting online and, and letting each other know that they care about each other and praying for each other on each other's behalf, God, we thank you that you brought this congregation here, that, we, that you've put your love in the center of us, God, and may we stay connected to that. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Bless you each.